Hey, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to our Senior Scam Stopper seminar. Um, so we're doing a hybrid event today, obviously, which means uh, all the lovely folks in here today uh, are participating, as well as folks on Zoom are going to be able to participate. Uh, I'm Alex Lee. I'm your uh, California State Assembly member. Today, going to be joined also by our State Senator Bob Wykowski. But I want to just thank you all for being here. Uh, luckily, it is. Oh. Luckily, the weather's cleared up a little bit today as well. So that's very good. Um, I want to thank the, thank the AgeWell Center for hosting us today in Fremont, as well as our partners, the Contractors State License Board, the Bureau of Household Goods and Services, Department of Financial Protections and Innovation, and Department of Insurance, too. Um, today, we are going to hear from experts <clears throat> about common scams that target senior citizens and how you protect yourself from them, especially in the digital age. Scams can come in many different forms and can often be difficult to identify. The best, thing you can do, the best thing you can do is what you're doing today, making sure you have the right and best information. So I'm excited today that in addition to being able to meet with you all here in person, we're also obviously talking to folks online, so we're in Zoom right now. It's important for us to be able to get information to you and be able to answer questions in whatever format you prefer. Some of our neighbors may prefer the in-person format, which I assume is everyone here today, and some may prefer attending online. That's why I'm proud to be utilizing our hybrid format today. <clears throat> in that spirit, I also have a bill this year, AB 1944, which will add an option for elected officials and the public to participate remotely without having to disclose their uh, addresses um, so they can continue to um, participate in local government without the need of always showing up in person. Over the past two years, we've seen that remote public participation at meetings is not only possible, but incredibly helpful for making many folks who otherwise if excluded from decision-making processes included. I know, that, I know that this can be implemented and look forward to when this style of hybrid format can be utilized to all local government meetings. And a little bit housekeeping rules because I know there'll be a lot of questions. Uh, if you're here today in person, you'll notice that there is information from our presenters in the canvas bags on your tables, which you've all received. And if you're watching online and would like the take-home take informational pamphlets for our presenters, please get in touch with our office. Uh, the contact information is on your screen right now. You can email or call us. Um, yeah, so the phone number's on there. Uh, we will also have time at the end for you to be able to ask questions to our presenters. And if you're here in person, you can write your questions on the cards at the center of your table and hand it to either Jariah, who's my staffer there in the sweater, or you can hand it to Andre, who's the Senator Wachowski's office, or you can hand it to Ashwin, um, who is outside on the table. So if you have a question, and you can hand it over to one of our staff. And if you're watching online, you can ask questions using the Q&A feature on Zoom or in the Facebook comments. And the Q&A feature, of course, is on the bottom of your screen. No matter how you're watching the presentation or how you ask the question, we will do our best to answer that question today. But if we aren't able to get your question today, please do make sure to follow up with someone, and we'll make sure you get your answer. Now, uh, before we get started with all the uh, presentations, I'll introduce our state senator, Bob Wachowski, to give some opening remarks as well. Well, thank you, Alex. And um, it's nice to be in uh, person with some with folks. Welcome. Good afternoon to the new uh, Age Well Center. I'm sorry, I'm a long time resident of Fremont, so I keep calling it the senior center. So I'm going to I'm going to learn to uh, do things uh, differently also. Um, I'm delighted to be here in person, love my job representing you in the uh, state Senate. And I really want to thank uh, Assemblymember Lee for taking the lead in organizing uh, this uh, today's event with the agencies that are uh, here. It's, he's newly elected, he's in his first term, and he's really done a great job up in Sacramento. We we're all proud of the work that you're doing. So thanks for having me here and helping out. Um, and this is the idea of scams is not new. I mean, we have the Contractors Licensing Board, which was set up in 1929. The, we have the Department of Insurance, which started off in 1868. That's 150 years ago, designed to protect consumers like yourself. It was a different time in the 19th century. Um, what has changed is the ingenuity of the people who are doing the scams and are, and are cheating uh, folks. They're, we're focusing 
on seniors because there's a vulnerability that you have with the internet now and with uh, real estate calls about real estate. Sometimes you get bombarded with financial information. I'm, uh, my mother's in an assistant living now. She's been, uh, moved into a place in January and the amount of paperwork that my father and one of my, one of my sisters, Joyce, has had to gone through, have gone through is unbelievable. And there was a billing problem and I don't want to blur everybody over those, those challenges. But you know, the, I want to thank the agencies that are here today um, for coming here and uh, answering the questions that people have, because a lot of times you worry about what, how, how it's going to affect you, or, or am I going to make a mistake and, and say yes, and all my vital information is going to uh, be collected by some uh, scam. So people are clever. They're doing things differently right now. We're going to give you guys the ABCs of what's happening, at least with the professionals that are, that uh, police uh, these things and how you can improve um, the way you go about business. For, for people who take care, the, take care of folks, um, either children or professional uh, caregivers, this is an important uh, seminar for you also because you, you will alert yourself and be careful when you're confronted with people or you're approached with folks. So I'll turn it back over to uh, Assemblyman Member Lee. Please enjoy um, the afternoon, take good notes, and uh, make sure you protect yourself. Thanks so much, Senator. We really appreciate that. So uh, just as a reminder, if you have any questions, if you're watching online, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen there. And if you have questions today in person here, there's the piece of paper in the middle. Uh, we're fortunate to be joined that most of our presenters will actually be here in person, but we're going to start with our first presentation from Geraldine Middleton, who will be joining us from Zoom, from the Contractor's State License. Thank you, uh, Assemblymember Lee. Thank you so much for having me and for the Age Wells Center for providing um, this wonderful opportunity to provide uh, consumers with more information. As mentioned, my name is Geraldine Middleton, and I am with the Contractor's State License Board. Um, you'll hear me refer to us as CSLB. And uh, as mentioned by the uh, Senator, CSLB has been um, in existence since 1929. And part of our responsibility is to protect California consumers. Um, I'm sorry, next slide. <laughs> Uh, by regulating and licensing uh, contractors in the construction industry. Currently, CSLB licenses more than 290 uh, contractors in the state of California and in about 45 different classifications. And by classifications, I mean things like your plumber, electrician, a roofer, or general contractor. Those are classifications. Next slide. Sorry, next slide. Perfect. So as, as, as uh, mentioned before, we're trying to, we're, free, we're, we're here to talk about ways that you can protect yourself as a consumer, specifically as seniors, and some of the common scams that we see um, targeted to our seniors. And what makes them um, a vulnerable population sometimes? Because seniors tend to be very trusting, right? Um, there goes the days of, you know, a handshake and um, your word is your, your bond. Um, and so a lot of times, Unscrupulous contractors, unlicensed contractors prey on that trusting um, uh, factor with seniors in, in order to just create a relationship or manipulate them in order to take advantage of them. We've heard stories of unlicensed contractors, you know, building a, a relationship with a senior, offering to run errands for them or take them to the bank, all while in an effort to take advantage of them. Um, so, you know, these are ways that un, uh, unscrupulous uh, con contractors or unlicensed contractors try to uh, pry, pry on the trust of our senior population. Next slide. Some of the, the most common and biggest um, scams that we see here at the Contractor State License Boards is um, unlicensed contractors asking for very large deposit, oftentimes up to 50% of a contract price, right? You may be interested in remodeling your home or doing some work around your home, and an unlicensed contractor may ask you for 50% of that project price up front. Just know this, that in the state of California, the law says that you, a contractor can ask for no more than 10% or $1,000 of that contract price, whichever is the lesser of those amount. 
So regardless of contract price, the maximum amount of your deposit or your down payment should be no more than $1,000. And that's that initial payment that you pay the contractor before any work is started. Next slide. Other very common tactics that you might see from unlicensed contractors are door-to-door -door salespeople or pressure tactics. And that, by that, I mean, you might have someone come to your door unsolicited. Um, you weren't in the, the business of looking for a contractor, but they knock on your door and they have a wonderful opportunity, they say, right? Um, something that you have to take advantage of immediately, otherwise the deal would go away. Um, and they kind of force you into a situation that you may not even been, been looking for, right? Those pressure tactics or those, um, it's, you know, take the deal now or it's gonna go away type of um, scams are often targeted by seniors because they want you to sign on the dotted line as quickly as possible without doing your due diligence or researching, right? Um, other tactics that we've seen are scare tactics, right? You may have contacted a contractor to come into your home to take to take a look at maybe a simple um, problem. Common, uh, common uh, situation we see is maybe it's a small leak, right? And someone comes in, um, they're there for a few minutes, and then next thing you know, they not diagnose the problem as to be, you know, such a bigger problem that it actually is. So that small leak may now turn into like you need a whole repiping done of your home. These are tactics and they tell you, well, if you don't do it right now, you're in jeopardy of you know, damage throughout your home and you want to protect yourself. Um, those be very wary of situations like that. Take the time to do your own research, call in other contractors to make sure that this is indeed the problem that you're facing, right? You don't want to be pressured into signing a contract without having to do your time to do your own research to make sure that is indeed the case. Now, of course, we all know that there are emergency situations that do come up and you will need to have a licensed contractor fix that problem for you. But you probably have enough wherewithal to understand or to, to predict that that's a situation where emergency situation comes up and it will need your attention. Next slide. I'm sorry. Another very common scam or tactic that you'll see unlicensed contractors uh, employ is a verbal agreement. Um, you won't have anything in writing. It'll just be your word against his or hers word. Um, and they'll tell you, just because I'm an old fashioned type of person, I don't like to put anything in writing. We can just, you can just take my word for it. Now, of course you can see the problem with that, right? At the end of the day, if there's a problem, it is just your word against that other person's word. So be very wary of that. And don't be afraid to ask for your a bid or a contract in writing. In fact, it's the law. You should have your contract be in writing. And if you're getting estimates, ask for estimates that are in writing. That estimate or that contract protects you and changes in the type, um, price for materials or the cost of the work. I mean, we all know what's been happening lately in the construction industry about raising, I mean, rising uh, labor costs and material costs and shortages. Um, but having a written contract can help protect you in uh, uh, keeping those prices as agreed upon at the beginning of your, pro your project. Another tactic that's often used by an unlicensed contractor is they'll ask you to pay in cash, right? Um, it will give you a discount if you pay in cash. It's easier. We don't have to go through the bank. Well, again, like verbal contracts, it's your word against theirs. If at all, that way you know that you've written a check to an individual, it's traceable, and you'll have documentation if you need to later on down the line to prove what your payment was. Save a copy of that check along with other written documentation that you um, gathered throughout that process. Next slide. Well, what happens if you have become a victim of one of these types of scams or you fall you know, prey to one of these situations? Don't feel like you're out there alone. As a consumer, the state of California has established CSLB for that very reason. Um, you, we can be contacted by phone at 1-800-321-2752, or you can visit us on our website where you can file a complaint and we can help you through, through that process of dealing with either that licensed or unlicensed contractor. Remember as a senior and any individual in the state of California, you have a four year statute of limitation to file a complaint from the date of construction. So you may not have discovered this information right away, but now that you're sitting here, that maybe a red flag has um, come up and you've thought about it, like maybe perhaps I should be contacting CSLB. Remember that you do have a four-year statute of limitation from, um, from the date of construction. And a most recent development um, in the year 2021, the law changed, which extended your right to cancel period. 
Um, before that, it was a three-day right to cancel, but for seniors 65 and older, that's been extended to five days. And so that gives you an additional time period where you can do some more research, you can do your due diligence, and it helps protect seniors from solicitors like we mentioned before. So don't forget that you have, you have that uh, tool as a way of protecting you um, if you do decide to uh, sign a contract, but you need some additional time to think about the, the entire terms of those contracts. Next slide, please. This slide would, is just a, it'll show you what it looks like on our website if you click on the icon to file a complaint. It's a simple icon, it, um, pretty self-explanatory if uh, those of you are familiar with working um, on the internet. It's a, uh, you click on that button and it'll give you information about inputting your contact information and the contractor's information. Next slide, please. So we've talked a lot about unlicensed contractors. So why should you then hire a licensed contractor? Well, you'll be glad to know, and, and as another level of protection, that all licensed contractors in the state of California have passed a trade and law exam. And that means that they've demonstrated to the state of California that they have the minimum um, knowledge and experience level in order to do the work in this industry. In addition to that, they've also undergone a thorough background check. So we know who these individuals are. We're not guessing at their identities and they've provided us with documentation to support that. In addition to that, CSLB also requires that licensed contractors hold, they also have a workers' compensation policy in place if they have employees. Again, these are protections in place when you're hiring a licensed contractor. Unlicensed contractors will not have a bond and very typically they do not have workers' comp insurance. That construction bond can help in the case of if there are any is poor work in the future or the, the project is abandoned, there is at least something that the consumer can rely on in order to get um, financial re um, restitution or remedies. Again, the workers' compensation requirement for licensed contractors is if they have employees working for them, they're required to have a workers' comp compensation policy on file with CSLB. Again, as a consumer, you should ask your contractors to show you, if they show up to your project with employees, they should also have a workers' compensation policy in place to protect both you, the homeowner, and the workers themselves from injuries. Next slide, please. Again, as we mentioned, having a licensed contractor offers you a greater level of consumer protections. Um, in addition to those requirements that CSLB has for co licensed contractors, if there is a dispute or if there's a problem, CSLB can step in and help with negotiations, mediation, or even arbitration of those disputes. And those services are to you as a consumer when you're engaging in a contract with a licensed contractor. Um, with an unlicensed contractor, even though we will uh, investigate complaints against licensed contractors, we're very limited in some of the jurisdictional um, issues that we have. We can't ask a licensed contractor to come back and do work or nor will we ask them to repay your money. Um, but those are options that we may be able to have if you're contracting with a licensed contractor. Again, well, just as a reminder, the state of California requires anyone that is working in the construction industry um, where their work and the, the cost of their work labor and the materials exceeds $500, they're required to be licensed in the state of California. So that's the combination of both labor and material. If it exceeds $500, you as a homeowner are required to hire a licensed contractor and that individual is required to be licensed. Next slide, please. So we talked about licensed contractors and how do you find a great licensed contractor? Well, like most things, you talk to your friends and family for recommendations, right? You talk to them about their experience with that contractor. But in addition to that, you also want to make sure that you're checking to see that this individual actually is licensed. And there is a tool on our website where you can find out, is my contractor licensed? Again, it's at our website, www.cslb.ca.gov. In there, you'll input the name of the individual, the company, or the license number and you, it'll give you information as to whether or not that licensed person is um, active. Do they have a workers' comp complaint? Have they had any disciplinary action in the past against them? All that information is available. And if you don't have access to the internet, you can also contact us again at the 800 number where we can provide you with that same information. Next slide, please. Oh. 
I apologize. I think my presentation might have been cut there. This is a um, right. So this is a. Your presentation ended, Joe. Here. Okay. okay. Well, Geraldine, I really appreciate your presentation. Uh, we already got some questions related to it already, so we'll come back to you for some questions um, right after this. But we're going to move on to our second presentation uh, from Nicole Bowles, Bowles with the Bureau of Household Goods and Services. And I believe Nicole is here with us in person, right? Very good. Right. Here you go. Thank you. And if you stand here, the virtual folks can see you. Too. Okay, thank yes. you so much. <clears throat> There we go. Thank you so much. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Nicole Bowles. I am the supervising special investigator at the Bureau of Household Goods and Services for the Northern California region. Thank you, assembly member, and thank you, Senator, for having us here today. We're really excited to be here. Next slide, please. The Bureau of Household Goods and Services is comprised of three programs, electronic and appliance repair, home furnishings and thermal insulation, and household movers. Next slide, please. The Bureau holds jurisdictional authority over household movers, furniture and bedding manufacturers, furniture and bedding importers, furniture and bedding wholesalers, furniture and bedding retailers, bedding sanitizers, custom upholsterers, thermal insulation manufacturers, supply dealers, electronic service dealers, appliance service dealers, service contract sellers, or uh, more commonly known as extended warranties, and service contract administrators. Next slide, please. So one of the biggest scams that we see in our industries involve unpermitted household movers. Um, it's California law that a household mover must be licensed by the Bureau of Household Goods and Services to transport household goods on California roadways. Next slide, please. So some of the biggest scams that we see involving household movers involve their website advertisements. They'll have really elaborate websites. Um, they'll even have a number on their website that might appear to be their license number or permit number. Um, their license number or the permit number displayed can be canceled, suspended, revoked, or fraudulent. Um, another tactic that unpermitted movers will use is that they'll show up on moving day with an unmarked truck or they will rent a U-Haul truck, an Enterprise truck, or a Penske truck and have no advertisement associated with the company that you thought you contracted with. Sometimes unpermitted movers will ask for cash payments or large deposits. Um, if a mover offers an estimate without visually inspecting your goods to be moved, that's also an indication of a household mover who may be unpermitted because in by California law, they have to inspect your goods before they provide you an estimate to move your goods. <clears throat> Another tactics that some of these unpermitted movers will use, um, they'll provide you contracts or other moving documents that are blank or missing information. Um, so you'll want to be aware of any missing information or blank lines on contracts that you may be signing um, for a household move. Next slide, please. So how do you protect your move? You can verify um, a California mover's permit status on our website, which is www.bhgs.dca.ca.gov. On our website, you'll be able to to get re free resources and tools to help you protect yourself from moving fraud. So they have some really great information if you're going to be moving to or from the state of California. 
um, and they can give you some helpful tips and flyers as well. Next slide, please. <clears throat> In our electronic and appliance repair industry, one of the most common scams that we see involve major appliance repair. So a major appliance would be your dishwasher, your washing machine, your refrigerator, a freezer, so on and so forth. Um, California state law requires that the service dealer provide you a written estimate of the cost um, and that it must be in writing. So if you receive a verbal estimate that's a pretty good indication um, that you should request something in writing so you don't get scammed. It's a way to protect yourself. Also, a service dealer can charge for additional parts or labor if they indicate that the total, what the total repair charge will be and they get your approval first. So a service dealer cannot just tack on additional parts or labor when they're uh, repairing one of your appliances they have to receive your approval first. So again, better to get everything in writing so that in the event that something does happen or your price skyrockets, you have something to go back to in writing stating what your original estimate was. A service dealer is required to return all parts unless the parts are unsafe or toxic. Um, they are rebuilt on an exchange basis or if you give the dealer a waiver on returning the parts to you. So another scam that we see is that a service dealer will come out, they will repair a part of your refrigerator, and then you discover that that part wasn't uh, the part that was causing the issue in your refrigerator. So maybe the service dealer took this part, it was really expensive, and then they charged you for it and never fixed the issue. So as a consumer, you are entitled to ask for those parts back so that you have those parts to your original appliance. <clears throat> Next slide, please. For more information um, regarding the electronic and appliance repair program or home furnishings and thermal insulation program, you can contact the Bureau at 916-999-2041 or visit our website. Our email address is homeproducts at dca.ca.gov. You can email general questions to this email, or if you'd like to file a complaint, um, I have some additional resources for you. Next slide, please. So filing a complaint, you can file a complaint online with us via um, website submission at the website www.bhgs.dca.ca.gov. If you prefer to print the forms, you can mail those forms to us at our address at 4244 South Market Court. Suite D, as in David, Sacramento, California, 95834. If you'd like to submit the forms by email for our household mover program, you can submit them to hhm.enf at dca.ca.gov. And for our electronic and appliance repair and or home furnishing and thermal insulation program, you can email us at bear.enf at dca.ca.gov. If you are having trouble submitting a complaint online, or if you don't have the ability to mail the complaint, we're happy to take the complaint over the phone. You can give us a call at our main number, and you'll select option four for household movers, and you'll select option five for electronic and appliance repair or home furnishings and thermal insulation. Next slide, please. For legislative and policy matters, uh, you can contact our Bureau Chief, Justin Paddock, or either one of our policy managers, Diana Godinez or Yafana Lamar. Next slide, please. And for any enforcement matters, you can also contact our Bureau Chief, Justin Paddock, our Supervising Special Investigator, Alda Aguirre in the Southern California region, or me in the Northern California region. Next slide, please. Thank you so much for having us here today. We were really excited to participate in this seminar and I will turn it over to the assembly member. Thank you. Thanks so much, Thank you. Thanks so much for your uh, presentation, Nicole. Uh, slide over a little bit. And uh, next we're gonna have Fernando Ponce from the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation give us a uh, presentation as well. So give her, thank you. Thanks, Fernando. How's it going, everybody? 
Okay, uh, like I said, I'm Fernando, part of the DFPI, and so I'm gonna give you a little of information and I'm welcome to stay, stay a little later to answer any questions. Might be a lot to take in, a lot of the information we have who we cover, but you know, I'll stay afterwards. So go ahead, next slide. So who are we and what do we do? So we license and regulatory and regulate state agencies. So the best way to break it down is payday lenders, financial institutions that do any kind of money transaction within the state, as well as uh, student service borrowers, and um, as, as well as a, uh, excuse me, let me, let me finish these PowerPoints, I'll go back to it. We conduct audits, state and federal compliance review, com consumer complaints. Also, you know, we do any kind of uh, investigating if there's any illegal activity or unlawful, is that the abusive practices? And we provide consumers with information regarding these things. So going, going into this, so let's say there is a, a financial institution that you felt that you were wrong by. So we would investigate your complaint and we would uh, go over all the information like a, uh, a credit union or a student loan provider or any kind of institution that has a license that has to operate with the state of California, that's who we regulate. Next slide. So what do we provide? Again, I'm here to give a presentation on information. Our website has additional information. We have that booklet in the packet. We used to be the DBO, but now we're a different department. We renamed ourselves, so that has a lot of useful information you guys can use. It goes over everything in a kind of a, a brief matter, but you know, we'll give, we, I can give more detail. But our website has in more in depth, that's just to give you a general information of consumer protection and, and different avenues to protecting yourself. Go ahead, next slide. So some of the common practices and inspired pandemic um, abuse has gone on. So we have here a list of uh, different things that you can you can see the charities, credit card, debt collectors, home improvement, you've heard of PACE, people use this program to add maybe uh, solar panels. And so money transmitter in the red, what's trending? Grandparents. So this is one of those things that people have a phone call or text message. They have all the information that someone that's a family member asking for some kind of money, asking for a deposit for, uh, 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 you can have, a, um, what is it? The uh, You go to Walmart or something and get them some kind of uh, a gift card. So they have all this information from you and they ask you to go through that. So that's what's going on right now. Also financial relief. So during the pandemic, a lot of things happened where they wanted to ask you if you needed some financial debt relief. And so they would go over some fraudulent information of saying this is how we can help you. You can use your home as leverage. So that's what's going on right now. Also utility companies. So this is a big one right now that's sort of going on if you saw the news about Zelle. So someone will call you from a, a PG&E or in Sacramento, we have SMUD. We have all your information. They'll know exactly, they'll come up with a bogus number and say, we are not gonna take any uh, payment over the phone. Go ahead and pay us on your, on, through your bank. I will not ask, ask you for anything. So you go, you log into your bank account if you have access. You type in pay now or pay bill and it goes right through and you send them a, a, a basically it's almost like a, a money transfer of paying your bill and it's completely fraudulent. But they have all your information. And so I actually had a call like that. For mine, it wasn't different. I had Bank of America and didn't pop up, but they said, put it in a phone number. So I typed it in knowing this was a scam. And they said, do you see that name? And it was like a Danny, a, uh, a name I didn't understand. It said Denny. I said, okay, yeah, that's that, that name's coming. Okay, go ahead and put, put the amount, put your $400, you owe $400. And so I said, well, that number's from, uh, from New York. If you're saying you're part of SMUD, which is in Sacramento, that doesn't match up. He hung up. So on other, bank, on other banking systems, it might say pay now, pay bill, pay pg &E. So this is happening right now where you log into your own account. So this is really, you know, uh, it, it was on the news. So something to take uh, note of the tap. Next slide, please. A little bit of uh, cyber safety. So same thing, online information, online banking. This is kind of, it used to be prevalent a lot more and people maybe are, are getting wise to it. The uh, email from your bank account says, click here to your bank has been, your bank account has been, uh, you know, as there's been some anti-theft in it. It's not true. We have to watch what that, we have to watch what we do all the online banking. Securing the network. So a little bit with a little bit of lock and the HTTP, as you see there on the slide, it's about going to legitimate websites and doing the website search yourself. So one of those things that we encourage is to not use websites that are emailed to you or that are given to you through text message. So that's something to uh, double check. Limit your personal information. Again, this has to do with just with social media now, it asks you to put in your information for almost anything. And so what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're limiting the amount of information you give it on online. Two-step verification. I know I'm really annoyed when it makes you do that. Do you want to add your phone number? Do you want to write your email instead of having uh, one, you have two? It works out. But let's say something nefarious is happening with your account. Well, it said, did you make that transaction? Did you change your password? And it will give you a text. Or, and if, you, if you're some of those people that have an email, that has a thousand email, 
you might not see that. So two-step verification is really important to do in order to make sure you're safeguarding your information. And then password. This is something that's really hard. We encourage people to change their password maybe once a year. I know that might be difficult. You might forget it. We'll change it by one digit or by one or by one letter. So that's something we're encouraging you to help you and safeguard your online information. Next slide. So a little bit about safe, safe and personal information. Again, this is something that's very prevalent is the telephone number, the telephone calls. So they call you with personal information, hang up. They, 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 they leave you a voicemail, erase the voicemail. Uh, again, a lot of these uh, scammers are attempting to leave you voicemail and try and call back, have you answer the phone, they call over and over again. So we wanna prevent that from happening. And let's say they do call you and you do think that something's going on. Well, we encourage you to Google the phone number, Google the institution, and double check what they're asking about, what they're referring to. A little bit of online services. So this has to do with, with again, with someone emailing you about something that's going on with your account, you should check it yourself without an email or without a phone call. So I'm encouraging you to basically, if you're worried about something that you owe, if you're worried about um, owing, a, owing a bill and that you've seen it and it looks legitimate, we're asking you to do it yourself, to do it one step instead of a, listening to the person on the phone or, going, or listening to that email or text message. So a little bit, you know, you get into the email or text message. Now, oftentimes, they'll give you a link within your text message. It looks like a legitimate website. It looks like something that you should be used before. We encourage you to not use that link that's in the text message. We encourage you to, to block it. Uh, unless it's a verification of a fraudulent account that happens right in front of you, it never ha it, it will not happen out of the loop. So let's say you swipe your credit card and something happens where the creditor didn't work that time you swipe it again. If you have a online protection, it will happen instantaneously on your phone if you have it. It doesn't happen randomly when you're sort of at the supermarket of your account. So we're asking you to not use those text messages and to not you know, partake in those kind of messages if they send you any. A mail, this is sort of an old, uh, a true uh, system just to shred your mail, shred your information. There are people, you know, people go through the trash can, people sort of go through your information. They find out um, something that you might not think about, but if you get a lot of credit card uh, mail, uh, credit card offers to the mail, it actually means you have good credit. So people target those kind of mail because this person they know is financially sound or getting a lot of offers. So then they will start targeting your trash can to get your information. So it seems very you know, mundane to just toss it out. We're asking you to shred it. And so and, and the next bullet point here is the credit and the debt transaction. So this is one of those things that we ask people to maybe if you interchange your credit or your debit transactions, we have you pay attention to what's going on. A little personal story. I, I kind of use my credit card here and there. I was in uh, Highway 5. I used my my uh, credit card instead of my debit card for a, a you know to fill up my gas tank. And there was a an illegal transaction on my credit card. Now, if I'm using intermittently both cards, I might not catch that. And so I looked it up and said, I don't know what these are, what these a uh, these uh, payments are for what they have to do with anything with my credit card. And she said, Yeah, sure enough, it looks like they tried three times. And the fourth time they got through. And so that's one of those things that credit card helped you track. But it's, you know, my point being is that if you're using both credit and debit, to please keep track of both of those transactions and see which ones to track them up, making sure there's nothing illegal going on in any of either account. Monitoring and freezing your credit. If you don't have any uh, taking out a loan, if you're not buying a car, if you're not refinancing your house, it's really easy to freeze your account. I tried it and it worked. And the reason I don't work when I was buying my house, my agent said, please unfreeze your transunion account. So that's one of those things that you don't think about. Let's just say, yeah, I don't have any credit cards. I don't have any, any kind of uh, big purchase I'm gonna do. You can go ahead and freeze your accounts online and that will safeguard you because it's, it's gonna block it. Again, my two other uh, trans, uh, credit bureaus did go through. My one was frozen and I unfroze it within you know, 10 seconds. Let my agent know that it was unfrozen and we went ahead and you know, so I can purchase my house. So it's one of those things that is available to you to freeze your account. And check writers, if you're still using the, these checks, there are special pins that embed themselves to the paper. I know, I don't know if you guys use those check, but there, it is one of those things to think about about those, those pins that bleed a little bit into the paper. So it, it prevents them the washing. I know that's kind of an old school thing, but it still exists. So if you're using checks, it's important to use those pins as you safeguard your information. And then the last you know, bullet point at the bottom, and if you believe you've been a victim, well, that's where we're here is for you to report that. So the big thing about um, DFPI we want people to know is that a lot of the uh, scams go underreported. And so we don't know what's going on. We don't know about what's hitting certain communities. So we want people to report what's going on. We want people to uh, let us know how they felt scammed. And a lot of times what happens is people are embarrassed. So the biggest thing is they're ashamed to lose, you know, the 300 bucks to 200 bucks. And we want you to just report it to us so we can help 
other people and send out these notices and tell people that within the community of protecting seniors, especially this group, that this is happening to your communities and please let us know what's going on. Next slide, please. So learn more about us, of course, the dfi.ca.gov. Again, we have a lot of information for everyone to be able to learn a little bit about us. And if you feel like you need more information on what we do, we're always available. We do have a, a, call, a call center as well to help you file a complaint. There's our website as well. And again, if you feel like you need more help, we have our number there to help you with a complaint or to help you look up a lender, look up a license. So let's say you think uh, they don't have a license. You know, well, let's look them up. We can see if their license is legitimate, even if, if it's um, if they show you all the paper, if they have a car, they have an office, we can still look them up for you. It's double checking your information, making sure that you um, have gone through all the lists of everything being legitimate and they can work in the state of California. And then emailing us, if you have a question, we're you know available to answer your question with every, anything you need. Of, uh, if we're not the right agency, something that we like to tell everyone, if it's not us, we're gonna find you who it is. So if it's another department, we're gonna do the search for you and make sure you know where to go uh, for uh, information that you need. And then of course, you know, I'm here giving a free presentation. If you have any group that wants to have more presentations about scams, I have we have different presentations, a little longer, and you know, maybe like an hour of different topics. But you know, I'm here to just help the community and educate you guys a little bit more. Next slide, please. And if you want to know a little bit about our, you know, about us, we're on social media. We do put, we do have a Facebook, we do have a, a LinkedIn, we do have a Twitter. So if you want to look at some of the stuff that's going on, we announce our meetings. A lot of the meetings are virtual. So if you didn't feel like you want some more information, want to learn more. You can go on our Facebook and we do have our meetings there so you can log in and be virtual. And then if you want to subscribe to any of our communications just to learn more about what's going on in the scam and how you can protect yourself, you know, we're available as well too. Thank you very much. So much thanks so much, Fernando. Um, one of those important points to talk about is the triangulation of information, right? If you're not sure about something, it's always good to double check with someone else with the internet. It's always really good. Um, so our last presentation, so our last in-person presentation we had is from uh, the California Department of Insurance. And Peter Mesa from the California Department of Insurance is going to be giving our presentation, and then we'll do, then we will be doing questions after that. Thank you. So good to be here. Thank you kindly for the opportunity, the invitation to the assembly member and uh, to the uh, state center. I know he's not uh, yet to leave, but. It's good to see everybody here. I think I can see everybody's eyes almost, but I'm gonna to have to stick right here because we have a, uh, a camera also here. So I'm not gonna be able to look around the corner there, but um, it's so good to be here. I'm with the Department of Insurance. We sometimes call it CDI. So if I say CDI, you know what I'm talking about, the California Department of Insurance. We're a state agency. We regulate all lines of insurance, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, um, traveler's insurance, I mean, there's so many lines. I'll, it might take me half an hour to go through all of them, but you can go to our website and also uh, it's on the bottom of every slide and you can get more information or we can ask that question too. Um, so we've done a lot of things this, um, uh, this last year. Uh, we've done over 275 events. We've reached actually 166,000, 166,000. That's a lot of people. Uh, we've done that through uh, virtual meetings and so forth. So I'm really proud of that. Um, rate regulations on our legal branches returned $3 billion back to consumers. You know, with the pandemic that has occurred, uh, there was a lot of, actually a lot of uh, insurance companies, they weren't really spending a lot of money, you know, because there wasn't a lot of claims. People weren't driving. So those insurance companies were like, hey, they're making money left and right. We're like, no, wait a minute. You got to give some money back to the consumer and the same with businesses. So we were able to get the insurance companies to return about $3 billion back to consumers. We're real proud of that. Our, our consumer services team also has reached over 40,000 consumers and we were able to recover $134 million. So that's with the complaints when people present complaints about you know something that their insurance company is not paying, uh, whether it's a rate and underwriting issue because the premiums maybe are incorrect and so forth. So we're really proud of the work that we've done there. Next slide, please. So let's talk about seniors and let's get into it right away. Seniors are the largest population that is targeted for scams. Why do you think that is? Anybody want to raise their hand? You know the reason, I'll answer it for you. 69% uh, of the wealth is within the senior community. 
approximately 69% of the wealth in the United States is within the senior community. So you've got a target. You guys have seen the, the, the target logo, you know? Yeah, the one, the round, yeah. And so the minute they see you coming, all of them, everybody, they see the logo, they, you're a target. And I don't, I don't want you to be a panic or be over, um, you know, worried about this. You just have to be aware, right? That's the thing, just be prepared. So um, why are seniors a big target? Because of that reason. And uh, so you must be very careful. You must, you, you come from a different generation. Remember that. You come from the generation where you shake your, somebody's hand and that's your word. My dad, I kid you not, sold a home with a, a handshake. And we discovered it after my dad had passed, you know, many years later. And we discovered he had a home that was still in his name. So we went back to the, the, or to the, had to go look up the owner and we went to his home and said, Hey, you know, the deed, everything is in my father's name. He goes, you know what? You're right. But I have this little piece of paper that we wrote real quickly and we both signed it and shook on it. And I go, let me look at it. And we looked at it. Go, oh, okay. Legally, it was legally, it wasn't his though. You know, we could have fought that and everything, but you know, it was like, that was the agreement they had. And it was there. It was my dad's handwriting. That's that you come from a different generation. That's not how we deal with that. Okay. You, 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 you've got to have things in writing. You must understand what is going on. You've got to be careful. You know, this whole thing about people coming over your home, that's not really where you're at now. Okay. People can't just come over your home and try to sell you things and so forth. Then I'll talk about that a little more. Next slide. So scammers are always selling these uh, different fake and unauthorized at home COVID-19 test kits. And they want, what they want is your information. That's what everybody is trying to get. If they can get your information, they have a lot of power. Okay, they can do a lot of things. We've seen where they have actually uh, billed uh, like Cal, Cal, uh, Medi-Cal or, or uh, Medicare. Okay, and then all of a sudden so they, they charge for, you know, a electric wheelchair. And then like a couple of years later when you actually need it, Okay, they fraudulently did it with your information, your social security. And then when you need it, they're like, social security is like, uh, or Medicare is saying, wait a minute, you already got that wheelchair two years ago or a year ago. You know, that's a problem, okay? So be careful with that. Report any COVID-19 fraud to the OIGHHA at gov or call this number here. And we're gonna provide these numbers for you. Next slide. Uh, this is a common insurance fraud against seniors annuity. What is an annuity? It's simply a contract be between you and an insurance company, a life insurance company. They agree in exchange for your premiums to pay at some given time. Usually it's down the line in the future when you're ready to retire. They agree to give you dividends. So you'll have income that will also supplement your social security, your 401k plan, or some other retirement plan that you have in place. Okay, so it's a great thing if you get into it at the wrong time, at the right time. If you get into it at the wrong time, it's going to be really devastating for you. We've seen where agents were, were selling, were selling these plans to somebody that was 85 years old and it was not going to begin to pay out because they were 105 years old. Okay, so you can kind of see the problem there. Okay, so you need to be very careful. Careful, is it right for you? If you're at the right age, uh, where you're before you know, before retirement, it could be a good plan. If you're already close to retirement age, the chances of it working for you have diminished substantially. Next slide. We also, we still see to this day, uh, premium theft where and you're turning your money into an insurance agent and he's saying, continue to send me your money and your premiums and, and then he's not really turning them in. And you really never ever got anything from the insurance company, you know, directly, but you're just paying the insurance agent. Uh, and we've seen a lot of, we've seen agents do this. Now, we do regulate not only the insurance companies, but we also regulate insurance agents. There's about 400, roughly about 400,000 agents that are licensed in the Department of Insurance. We believe the majority of them are doing the right thing, but all you need is that one insurance agent that gets a hold of your uh, finances and makes a disaster out of it. I can give you story after story. I won't do it today, but there are still uh, auto stage accidents that happen. We've seen an uptick in this. They come in pairs, one stops suddenly in front of you, they'll get, you know, suddenly get in front of you and then they stop suddenly, the one next to it is trying to keep you out from getting out of that lane. So you will only be able to hit the car in front of you. And then they make all these claims, you know, 
they, they, they try to you know, take your insurance company and offer all the money they can. Next slide. The agent, uh, yes, sometimes there are some warning signs. They offer you these free seminars, these free meals. How many have got, ever gotten a, 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 an invitation in the mail for this beautiful, nice, yes. You know, I used to be a, so offended because I never used to get them. And I was, I would, I was, I've been doing this for over 15, maybe longer years. Okay. And I kid you not, everybody would talk about, it. man, I got this hundred dollar meal and all this. And I was so offended. I was like, why don't I get these? You know? And I started getting a little gray in my beard here. And guess what? I started receiving them. And I, and I, and I wish I had brought one that I use on my virtual presentations because every time I get one, I always like to read the fine print. Now, if you look at the big print, the big print gives, but the fine print, what does it do? It takes it away. The small print takes it away. And you know what it says? It says, these are the type of things it says. I wish I had it with me because I, 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 can, I can tell you that's what it says. One of them says, if you're in the insurance profession, please do not come. Okay. Why? Because we know too much. Okay. And we're going to be raising our hand and, and telling everybody, you know, and then the other one that I just received the other day said that essentially this is not a professional financial product. Like, you know, we don't guarantee anything in this. Okay. Now I'm not against insurance agents. Okay. I, I was an insurance agent. I know how hard it is. I was a broker and I was an insurance agent with farmers. Group. I know how important it is for them to make money, but you cannot be unethical. So it's important for you to understand when somebody says, Hey, come to our meal and, and so forth. Just be careful, okay? Because the, the, they're going to pressure you to come and visit you at home. By the way, we do not allow our insurance agents to come to your home uninvited. They cannot come home to your home and say, hello, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I was just next door to your neighbor. You know how they're really good neighbors of yours, and they told me I could come and talk to them. No, that is not allowed, okay? If they come to your door, please do me a favor. Let them know you're there, but don't open the door. To say, okay, Mr. and Mrs. Insurance Agent, would you leave your business card there at the door? And I'll get it later. When you feel it's safe, go get that card and give us a call. The license number has to be on the insurance agent's business card. It has to be there. They will be in another violation if it's not there. But you just tell us who is that person that came there because they are not allowed. They have to write to you 24 hours in advance. They have to tell you who's coming. They have to tell you what their business is that they want to present to you. And they have to tell you that you have the right to end that meeting at any given time. And our phone number, by the way. All that is has to be in the letter and writing. So do not uh, allow yourself to get caught up in something that you know you don't you, you, you could really be pressured into. Okay. There's a insurance bill of rights, cyborg, that you can get online. Uh, I'm not sure if we brought it today, Mary Beth, but if, if we didn't, uh, you can get that online. It's a very good, you know explains a lot of your rights when you're 65 years or older the penalties turn into uh, felonies for our insurance agents so there's a lot of protections for you uh, free look period and so forth I'm not going to get into all that next slide uh, I encourage you to check the status of your insurance agent your insurance company uh, you can go right there to our website or even give us a call and we'll check to see if there's any activity on that agent um, any uh, any problems with them and so forth uh, make sure you ask all the questions thoroughly and truthfully. You know, if the agent for some reason says, hey, don't worry, don't, don't, don't worry about this area, leave it blank, I'll take care of it later, just sign on the job line. No, do never, never leave anything incomplete. Make sure you understand everything. Make sure you get everything in writing, compare policies, ask questions, and never feel pressured or intimidated, okay? Never feel that pressure. If it's good, if it's too good to be true, you know what? It probably is too good to be true. It is too good to be true. So stay away from things that you feel pressured and the deal's only good till today. And it's not gonna be good till tomorrow. No. I always, I always just I always say to people that pressure me when I'm buying big ticket items, I say, you know what? I always sleep overnight. I always think of it. And they say, Well, it's over tonight. I said, Well, you know, lost a deal. Sorry. Because I really have to think about it. I don't have a buyer's remorse. Next slide. Uh, don't engage. Don't be polite. We come from a, you guys come from a different era here. A lot of politeness, you know, you, people call you on the phone and you're like, yeah, you know, it's a phone number you don't need, you don't know or anything like that. I mean, how many get calls on their phone? Okay, we all do. It's annoying. You know what I do now? 
I say, send me a text. You know, I have an automatic response. By the way, my wife, my wife, she deletes her, she blocks every number that, that she doesn't even know. That's how leave me a message they never leave me a message so i'm just telling you be careful learn to to just hang up you know if you're one of those persons that has to answer the phone answer the phone but hang up okay and report fraud next slide these are our phone numbers i'm about to wrap it up here here's our numbers uh and these are important numbers and i encourage you to uh write these down to take note of them uh, it's important for you to know that we're here to help you the department of insurance is ready to assist you in any issue related to insurance. And thank you so kindly. I think that's my last slide, right? Go to the last one, if I'm not mistaken. Can you go next just to see? Oh yeah, go to where the, our senior gateway is a beautiful place uh, where you can get a lot of information. Uh, and for the entire state, anything re regarding seniors uh, is here at this gateway and informational guides. Thank you kindly for your time. For presentation. Um, so we're going to do <clears throat> we're going to do a question and answer segment now in our last thirty minutes of our uh, time here today. So I, and Geraldine is still here with us via Zoom. So if I can ask our panelists to maybe join me up here, and we're going to do some Q and A. Um, so so just a reminder, we're taking questions that are online and from inside the room. So if you have questions, feel free to send them on the Q and A function down here. Are uh, there some folks who still have questions in the room? Um, we'll try to get through to all the questions uh, as much as we can, but here is the stack of questions I have in my hand already. And so I will try to group them by theme and summarize some of the things. But uh, if we don't get you an answer today, we'll try to get you an answer later on. So some of the questions for our experts I wanted to ask, um, and I've kind of grouped them by who I want to ask. Too. So is, um, first of all, thank you so much for presenting so many great, wonderful resources for everyone. You know, you covered, uh, scams that range from uh, home improvements, right, from construction to household appliances, the financial protections, and of course, all types of insurance. But if someone were to fall victim to be uh, fall victim of a scam, what do you say the first the first step for them to do is? How do they report it? So that's one of the things. Yeah. So that's one of the things I, I mentioned before uh, that we have in our, at least in our call center, is that um, the DFPI, the, any kind of financial institution or money transaction, we will try to get you the right organization. So we don't mind being a conduit for you to call us and go, who, this happened to me, who can I go to? So that's the number one thing we want you to call right away. People do not call. So this is one of the things that we pride ourselves on in a call center that has multi-language and is eight to five, and we'll take your call in and we'll get you to the right department and uh, pride ourselves in a one person handout. So we're not gonna send you to a couple of different people. We're gonna send you the right person and we, well, that's where you can file a complaint right away. I'll, I'll get that number back on, on the screen and then we can and we can give that, make sure everyone has that. Thank you for that. And we'll be sending out all the resources to everyone who's attended you today. If you have an RSVP email, it'll all be sent. Um, but this is the number for my office too. So you can always call us too specifically and we can help you troubleshoot as well. But I think that's the important thing is, you know, we're all here to help you all, all out. And if you feel that you or yourself have become victim of a scam, just keep in mind what you think the nature of the scam is, right? Is it an insurance-based scam? Is it a realtor? Oh, is it a, <laughs> is it a construction-based scam um, or insurance-based scam, right? We can start there. But of course, we have so many wonderful agencies here that they'll help you troubleshoot and figure it out, including my office too will help you figure it out if uh, you feel you're not entirely sure. So another uh, question theme that I saw was, um, is there anything happening regarding uh, scam calls in general? Right? Many of you have mentioned the uptick in scam calls and text messaging and what's generally do you think is happening in regards either to your departments or uh, generally in the state that folks can look forward to to help tamper down on spam calls or spam text messaging? Yeah. 
Yeah, so this is a common thing we hear. People are constantly getting these calls. And um, yes, you can file with the F FCC, um, uh, the Fre Federal Trade Commission, I think it is, uh, uh, Federal Communications. What is it, Federal Trade Communication? Yeah, FD. FCC. FCC? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, yeah. That's, so I, it's been a while since I had uh, a rep from them come at one of our events, but they, I think they can still do something. The problem is that the scammers don't respect it. You know what I'm saying? So even if you get on the no call list and say, don't, don't, don't call me and so forth, uh, scammers really don't respect that. So um, we just tell folks, just be aware. You know, if you don't recognize a number, uh, I, I don't even pick it up. If they really need to get a hold of you, they can leave a message, you know? And if it's uh, a family member, they'll also be able to get a hold of you. Usually you'll recognize your family, but it, it is an issue. We continue to hear the same thing. So that's what we uh, encourage people to do. Can I ask a real quick question on that? Sure. Uh, I get a lot of calls from opt-out uh, press uh, a number. Do you think I should not even respond to that? Spam yeah, so the question was about in getting, right, in the, in the questions, just, I'm just reading it for everyone else. In, in getting spam calls or spam messages, there's always the option for them opting out. And the question was, should I or should I not opt out of it entirely? Yeah, I, I, respond? I, I tell folks not, I tell folks not to even mess with it because you're going to end up being on the list actually. And so, you know, responding to all these things, you know, they're scammers, you know, so I wouldn't, since this, it's already a scam to begin with. So, yeah. I'll do that. Thank you. Anybody else? So regarding scam calls, I think the best thing that consumers can do and seniors just educate yourself. So if you have this feeling that something is wrong, that they're asking you for information that you're not comfortable giving over the phone, educate yourself, ask them where they're from. Don't be afraid to start asking them questions. Ask them, who are you? What do you want from me? What is your name? Give me a number that I can call you back at. Again, like my other counterpart up here said, everyone um, in your generation is so friendly. You want to be helpful. You want to give information, but go ahead and start throwing some questions at them. Ask them for their information so that you feel confident in the information that you're providing to somebody over the phone. I always do my research just because I have elderly parents who come to me and ask me questions all the time because I work for the Department of Consumer Affairs, Bureau of Household Goods and Services. They always have questions. And so I will help them and just tell them, you need to educate yourself. If they say they're from this place, ask them for their name, go online really quick. You can do it on your phone, check, check the information that they're giving you, fact check them. And that's the best way I think to protect yourself is just through the education. And just on the broader policy front, I'm not the expert to tell you what you should do in these scenarios. That's why we have our kids here. But on the policy front, um, the federal the federal government and federal policymakers, in conjunction with a lot of the, uh, the wireless carriers, were actually trying to crack, crack down a lot of the spam calls. So actually, there was a period, I think, just before the pandemic when you noticed there was a drop, small drop off. You also now notice if you have a smartphone, a lot of them will say spam likely or telemarketer very likely and there. And we're working together at the federal level to try to flag that. Uh, however, of course, the nature of scams, the nature of trying to do things at the border of legality is they have now found a new way and now they're trying to come back. And that's why you're seeing a resurgence of it. So there was for a small time, a quiet, a lull in spam messaging and spam texting. But again, just as our experts talked about, you know, it's really important to just triangulate your information, see who the heck is calling you, see why they want your information. And if you're not comfortable, don't answer them. I think that's always really helpful. And uh, Geraldine, if you're still on the call, I had some questions following up from your um, presentation. If you're still on, Geraldine. I'm here. Yes, I can hear cool. you. Cool. Great. So you talked about the right of cancellation days. I had a question from um, online, I think. It was, uh, so you mentioned that the right of cancellation under new California law that was passed uh, by us is that it extends for seniors instead of three days, it's five days of cancellation. Is that five days, five calendar days, or five business days? Five, five business days. Five business so if that, right. So if that company does business, let's say on a Saturday, then you would count the Saturday as part of those five days, but it's five business days. Awesome, thank you. And do you wanna talk about why those extra days are important? 
Right, similar to what um, some of the other panels have already indicated, right? Having that additional time to do your own research, um, confer with family members or friends allows you to be a better, a more educated consumer, right? Checking out those, that, those promises or the offers that you're being um, given by those individuals. That additional five, uh, that extended five period allows you that time to, again, make sure that you're making the very best decision for your situation and for your, um, your family. Okay. Okay. Oh, I see you moving again. Jordan, are you there? I'm sorry if I, I froze are. on my end over here. If, I, if you yeah, asked yeah. me an additional question, I didn't hear you. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. yeah, of course. I'm happy to. Uh, the question for you was Can we find out if contractors have complaints against them on the CSLV website? Can we yes. Yes, you can. So if you visit our website, um, on that same page, when you're looking up the information about the status of the license or whether or not they have workers' comp policy, there's also a complaint disclosure um, information that you'll find there. So these are complaints that have resulted in some sort of legal action against the contractor. For example, a citation or if that license had been revoked in the past, that information is available on our website. Great. And it'll give you, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, it'll give you information about the, the specifics of the type of violation that occurred. So if this contractor had a violation for poor work or if their contract was not in compliance, it'll tell you specifically what that violation was. Great, thanks, Shelby. Um, we got a question from Christina, it's a good question. It says, how can I check if a charity is legitimate? There are many organizations in support of Ukraine right so I wondered if any, I'm not sure if it's the domain of any of our, of our presenters, but are charities governed by any of our departments here today? No, uh, Attorney Charity. General. Attorney General. Yeah. You can actually find out if there are, yeah. You can actually find out if a charity is legally, you know, still in, in, in right standing. If you go to the Attorney General's uh, website, you can get that information there. It'll tell you if the charity is good or not. And again, if you have questions, triangulate online or you can call any of us too. Um, this, is, this is an interesting question. I do not know the answer to this one, so I'm very curious. Is um, what happens to scammers when they are caught? Will the victim be caught? Yeah. Okay. So the best way to be notified is to file a complaint. So if you were the victim of a scam and you want to file a complaint with the Bureau of Household Goods and Services, you'll file the complaint. And then once our investigation is complete, we will notify the individual who filed the complaint of the investigation outcome. If there's disciplinary action taken against the registration or the license, um, then that information will be made public knowledge once, it, once the business has gone through their due process. And we have a home insurance question for you all. So this comes from Ashok, is my home insurance premium went up by 25% this year. What are you doing to control? That's a great question. Um, we're dealing with that issue. Uh, we have seen uh, that there had been an uptick since 2017, the fires in Santa Rosa, I believe it's the tub fire. It's just been nonstop. So insurance companies have been dealing with this issue and there's been um, increases that have occurred. Uh, what we have seen is that uh, it's stabilizing. Uh, it's stabilizing. Uh, it was in 2020 that we have some data that shows there was uh, some companies that have actually decreased their, uh, it have made some adjustments on premiums. And so there are, um, we're hoping, you know, that uh, this is gonna improve. If you want to, you can call our 800 number at 800-927-4357 and you can get, uh, you know, some direction. There's some tools also online to find maybe a, uh, an insurance broker or agent in your area. You can try to, you know, 
see if we can get uh, something done with with that and find um, you know find another uh, insurance company that way. But yeah, it is an issue. We are aware of it, especially in the Wui, which is the high risk areas. So uh, I would encourage a person just to go ahead and if you would call our eight hundred number and let's see how we can help you. Thanks so much. Um, and of course, this is also something on advocacy front between the Department of Insurance and us in the state legislature monitoring these situations and figuring out when it is appropriate to use the tools of uh, administrative action and regulation versus changing the law. That's also important. So if it's also important to you uh, or important to you, you know, definitely feel free to reach out to our office about these issues. Um, this question is a bit more scenario based, and I'm not sure which um, agency it would be for, but uh, the question basically is, how, how should one react if a person is knocking on the front door to sell them internet service from a cell phone company? Uh, so perhaps they seem very legitimate, but they don't feel it in Yeah, that, just, just from my experience and having been around other speakers um, from PG&E, I'm PUC. Uh, the PUC, when they've been out at events, they say that there's been a lot of um, issues that have happened when people come to the door, even with uniforms, they'll come in pairs. This is a true, this is what PUC said. Uh, they've, had, they've seen them come out in pairs, one will knock on the door, and then uh, as soon as they get distracted, they get you out to look at your meter, your electrical meter box, and then they just go in. And they've had this issue happen quite a bit. So they, people come in real, actual, looks like real uniforms, but it's in fact, they're just there to you know, raid your home. So be very careful. The way to do it is go back to your bill, whether it's, you know, whoever it's from, PG&E or whoever, utility company, and call them and say, hey, listen, I have some folks here. Make sure you don't let them in the house. Make sure you keep that door closed. Make sure you call the company on the number yourself, okay? Not the number that they give you or the business card they give you. Uh, you don't even know if that card has also just been produced for the purpose of continuing the fraud. So that's what I have to say on that. Thank you so much for that. Um, also, I'm just sensitive that we have a lot of questions that are very um, scenario specific and without, you know, in the interest of protecting everyone's data privacy, I don't want to um, be very specific about everyone's issues. And if you definitely have a very specific scenario in which you need help with, contact my office or contact any of these departments. departments. Uh, information will be sent out uh, more regularly on that front. Um, I just want to see if there's any other questions out in the crowd right now. If anyone just wants to raise their hand and ask anything. Yes, ma'am. Is extended fraud like a scam or a telemarketer? You know, the extended warranty that they oh. said that was good product. Yeah. Is that, that a telemarketer? Or that, yeah. Are you talking about auto warranty? Um, yeah. Okay, I'll talk. Okay. So we repeat the question real quick. Yeah. So the question is, are those warranty calls, are they are they true or not true? We we actually regulate auto warranties. Okay. Any and the reason why we do is because anything that looks, walks, or talks like an insurance, the insurance commissioner will step in and say, Hey, you you company, you're acting like an insurance company. You must file, you must do everything, put reserves, and every single thing that they must do. Uh, if they start acting like an insurance company, we'll go in and step in and look at them. So this is the, this is the situation on auto warranties. Auto warranties, you'll get all these calls. They'll tell you your auto warranty is worrying, is about to be finished and all that. That's just a scam, okay? There are auto warranties that you can get at dealerships. Okay, that's, those are self-insured uh, policies, usually from dealerships. When it comes to a, a, a private auto warranty, it has to have an underwriting carrier. It has to be an underwriting insurer. There has to be insurance company, okay? So, you know, uh, I just encourage people. I used to audit, when I first started with the department 22 years ago, I used to audit these things. I used to get audit all these auto warranty things. And in my experience, in the five years that I audited uh, auto warranties companies, um, the majority of the time, you don't get a lot of money out of them, okay? So just FYI. That's what I have to say. Geraldine, I've got another question for you. If a contractor puts a lien or lien on our home during construction, how do we find out if the lien has been taken off once full payment has been made? Right. So um, the lien, once it's been placed on the, the property, 
is handled through the county register recorder's office. So you may um, have to contact the, your local county registrar recorder's office. Um, but a way to even prevent that from even happening upon full payment is to ask the contractor to provide you with an unconditional lien release when you've made that full payment, right? So in exchange for the full payment, you will get a copy of the unconditional lien release, which basically says that this contractor is paid in full, right? So they no longer have, or they've waived their lien um, rights to your property. But if that's been placed, you then have to, uh, of course, check with the county register recorder's office to confirm that it's been released. Thanks, Charlie. And this You're one's welcome. gonna be gonna be a, a rapid fire one because this is a person who's asking which agency handles scams with the following type of scams. So I'm gonna ask some quick ones. So for automated automotive and repair slash smog scams, which agency is that? <laughs> That's bar. Bureau of Automated Automotive Repair for Medical Medical Medicare scams. Uh, D H <laughs> it's one of the healthcare ones. <laughs> it's one of the healthcare ones. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing this exercise only to help, as I think this position points out, is we have a lot of agencies that do a lot of things, and we are here to help you navigate that. We, as we I mean, me specifically, my office is here to help you with that, but this is also indicative of how many resources you have, too. All right, the last, the last one, the last two I'll say is what about telecom companies and internet providers? That is the PUC. That is the PUC, the uh, Public, Public Utilities Utility. Commission. And the last one, what about rental property scams? Well, we'd say that rent to own. Rent to own is DFPI. So rent to own is DFPI. Yes. That's, that's what you'd say. Yes. That's right. So, yes, yeah, so there are a lot of different areas in which, of course, there are scams, there are exploitation that can happen, a lot of different agencies governing the same thing. And if you do have questions about that, feel free to reach out to my office, and we have direct liaisons with all the departments. Um, but it is also one of the perennial questions, I think, as I represent constituents and people ask me about is why do we have so many departments for so many different things? It's because there's so many different scams out there in so many different jurisdictions, but at the same time, we always have, uh, you know, talks about how to streamline and how to make government efficient too at the same time. So these are all very valid and all valid questions. All right. Oh, yes, question back there? So we have a question about timeshare problems and household insurance. I'm going to ask the power of insurance. I can do household insurance. So we're talking about um, the home warranties. Yeah, home warranties. Yeah. So, the, so that's not uncommon. We do regulate home warranties. Once again, the home warranty company has to have an underwriting. Uh, it has to have an underwriting insurance on it. So there are the common ones, you know, uh, I can't remember. I know it's American, uh, home, what is it called? Home Shield? Yeah, there's a few of them, right? There's only about four or five of them. But yeah, if you have any problems, give us a call, 1-800-927-4357. Uh, they should be legit. If, you know, if you're unsure if they're legit, call us and we can look it up for you and make sure that it's, they're all, all in the up and up. Thank you so much. Uh, last question, because we got a couple of these. I don't think this is within necessarily our expert, our presenter's expertise. But what about um, what agency or who should handle conservator scams by court attorneys and especially court attorneys or related industry uh, as they scam the elderly? Who would be the best to handle that? Well, financial. You guys will do financial if it's a financial. Uh... Personal, uh, professional, right? Yeah, yeah, anything with financials. Mm -hmm. So to reiterate, yeah, anything with financials that has to do with the uh, licensing in the state of California is the DFPI. So that's one thing that it is sort of, um, especially the name, right? We used to be DBO, so it's hard to, uh, to it's like, uh, and let me break it down to you, even debt collectors, right? Those that they call you. They, they are operating to receive funds from you, right? So they can't call you at 10 o'clock at night. So anything regarding to financial institutions that have to operate in the state of California, we uh, we regulate them. So it's very key to understand that is, is um, money coming in and out. Is, the only thing we don't do is the national banks like the Bank of America, Wells Fargo, but other smaller institutes and, and credit unions, that's who we regulate. 
Thank you so much. And I know we're running short on time, so I'll just take this last question. And again, if you had questions or specific scenarios you need help with, please feel free to contact my office uh, and we'll help you navigate and troubleshoot those things. Again, I still have a whole stack of my hand of questions we didn't get to. But the last one I just wanted to iterate and answer is, uh, is this information at the Age Well Center? So this presentation is gonna be found on my website uh, and you can call my office for the take home information, including the take home information that the uh, in-person recipients here will have. But all this stuff you can follow up with, I'm sure the Age Well Center can also uh, route you to our office and get you more resources as well, but it, it's all available for you all. But again, I wanna appreciate all our presenters for being here. Actually, they all came down from Sacramento, so please give them a round of applause for coming down here. Um, and again, you know, use your common sense, use your triangulation of data to know if something is real or something is not real. What are you, what are you pointing at? Oh, it's a question. Oh, what's real quick. I want to let you know how sincere that is. Oh. You, you have to, uh, really appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Well, I really appreciate you all being here. And again, you know, like take away the really great tips here, you know, lean on other folks in the community to keep each other safe. Um, as we all talked about spam calls, I got like 10 calls right now, but I'm also, I don't have, unfortunately, my position in life to deny calls constantly. <laughs> so I don't know if some of the times are legitimate or not. Um, so that's also one of my frustrations. Sometimes I'll pick it up. I think, I think it's someone in our community and it's like, did you know your auto insurance? Has to this is not a thing. So again, practice, practice common sense, lean on us for help. And we're always going to be available for you uh, to help assist you. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. Something else? Oh.